morning. Welcome. We're so glad to have you here with us today. Um, if you are visiting, we have a uh, card for you to fill out in the pew rack in front of you. Just, you know, fill out your information, drop it in the offering plate so that we know that you are here with us. Or we have a QR code up on the screen. You can scan that, fill it out. Um, <laughs> also, if you are joining us through live, or if you like to join us through live when you're not here, we have more ways available for you guys to do that now. We are on Facebook Live, as we have been for a while, but we are also YouTube Live, and DelrayToBaptist.com slash live are all ways that you can watch us if you can't be with us in person. We also have Parent Lab coming up today, this afternoon, in the Fellowship Hall. Um, it is a multi-ministry event, so if you have preschoolers, children, or youth, we will have um, a parent lab for you guys today. We are focusing on family worship. We will provide lunch, and children are welcome to join us in the fellowship hall. This evening, our discipleship classes begin, and if you're not signed up yet, don't let that deter you. We still want you here. Please join us. We have classes for all ages, from preschoolers on up, so please join us. I promise we'll find a place where you fit in. This Thursday, we have New Beginning Fellowship on the 19th at 10.30. Bring a covered disc to share. Um, and then this upcoming Saturday is our church-wide work day on January 21st. We'll meet here at 8 a.m. and just tackle some projects that we have around the place. We are asking if you have yard equipment, uh, like hedge trimmers, whatnot, a pressure washer, or any other tools or items that you think could be useful for the projects that we'll be tackling that day, please bring those with you. Um, and I even heard that Mr. John Devers might be bringing some, something special for us to snack on that day while we're here working. So, um, And then the next day, next Sunday, kicks off uh, Sanctity of Human Life Day, um, so please join us for that as well. Um, and then on the 28th, the children's department, we have Nerf and Nachos. If that's something that you're interested in, please see me, and uh, it's going to be a day filled with fun. So if y'all will join us, join me in prayer as we kick off our worship today. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day that you have given us to be able to be in your house together with other believers, God, with our church. I just pray that you will help us to, to really be able to listen, to learn, to go home today. Um, having been in your word and in your presence, God, and just to be able to gather together. God, I just thank you so much for that opportunity. I pray that you will be with Brother Bobby, with Brother Tommy, with our choir, as we all bring worship to you today, God. I just pray that you will be with each of us as we go, and in your name I pray, amen. The first line says it all. I stand amazed in the presence. Join me together as we stand this morning. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me. Oh, sinner condemned unclean. Singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own, and he bore the burden to Calvary, and suffered and died alone. Sing it out. Sing it out. forward to that day 
when with the ransomed in glory his face I at last shall see it will be my joy through the ages oh to sing of his love for me here we go sing it people said. Amen. Amen. Sing it out. The splendor of the King clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our god sing with me how great our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands, time is in his hands, beginning and the end. Beginning at the end, the Godhead three in one. Oh, our Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great! Sing it out. Oh, he is the name above all. He's the name above all names. Worthy of all praise. My heart will sing. Is a God. Sing that chorus. How great. How great. i 
Christ shall come. When Christ shall come. With shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart. Then I, then I will bow in humble adoration and there proclaim. people said amen Amen. you may be seated
come to that portion of our service where we specifically set a time aside to pray each week for our pastor search committee. It was brought to the deacons this morning that in their meeting they have chosen to come as a committee to the altar during that time each week and as your deacons are suggesting anyone who would like to accompany them to this altar each week during that time of prayer for our pastor search team you are welcome to come so at this time our committee and anyone who would like to join them pray Father you are a good God and this morning we are here to worship you to love you to sing our praises to you about how amazing you are you are the God who saves sinners like us you are the God who has chosen this church and loves this church God you love this church more than any of us in this room could ever love this church and we know that is true Father, we have elected by your sovereign plan a group of individuals who have uh, submitted themselves to, under your lordship to be guided in the process of choosing the next pastor of this church. And we all recognize in this room that these individuals are each week sinners, God, but they are also in love with you. And we pray a blessing upon each and every one of them right now in the name of Christ, that you would fill each of them afresh with your spirit and that that spirit would be accompanied by wisdom and by guidance. And as they meet week, uh, every time they meet God, that they would be filled with the wisdom of God and that their focus would not be on themselves or their own desires, but it would be on your desires and the things that you care about for this church, God. And that that's the things that they would discuss, the future of this church for your glory, to the glory of your name, to the ends of the earth. So we pray for each and every one of them as they meet. And as they do things individually with certain assignments they have, that you would bless the hands of the works and that they would be just simple, humble vessels of your glory for this church. We pray all this in the powerful name of Christ, the one who is all sovereign and has the plan before us laid out. In Jesus, amen. All right, as they're returning to their seats, it is time for Children's Church. <laughs> Ella said, I was ready. See you, James. All right. Good job, Wyatt. Showing your friend. Excellent. Let's stand together as we continue to worship this morning. At the cross... At the cross. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred hand for sinners such as I? Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. At 
the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. At the cross, at the cross, I lay my burdens down. At the cross, you paid the cost for the freedom I have found. At the cross, at the cross, I lay When you gave your life as a sacrifice so that I could be set free. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, I lay my burdens down. At the cross, For the freedom I have found At the cross, at the cross I lay my burdens down At the cross, you paid the cost When you gave your life as a sacrifice so that I could be set free. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. Rolled away, it was there by faith. I receive my sight, and now I am happy all the day. If our deacons would come forward this time for our morning offering. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us to come into your house and worship you and learn about you. And Lord, I want to pray for the people that lost so much this week. Uh, they lost their homes. Some lost family members due to the storms. Lord, I ask that you bless them and touch their hearts. And let them know that you can heal every scar and every wound. Let them know that people love them and that we're there for them. Lord, I want you to bless this offer and multiply it. May it do so much good for us in this world. And may we never take our eyes off the, the one true prize that was given us, your son. Thank you for his gift. And thank you for all that you've done for us. In your heavenly name I pray. Amen.
can only imagine it. Uh, our hearts are heavy this morning because some of our fellow Alabamians have experienced extreme grief this past week when tornadoes came through our state. Uh, I hope there's never another day like April 27, 2011, when so many of the storms hit our counties. I think close to 59 of our counties that day were affected by storms. Uh, but if you were in a storm this week and you lost a loved one, this was a tragic event. And others lost their houses and all of their earthly possessions, all they've worked for for years, and are even today grieving over the loss of what they've experienced in life. But there's hope. There's a yellow shirt army called Alabama Baptist Disaster Relief Volunteers who have already been deployed. The Montgomery Chainsaw Crew is in Selma as we speak. And other disaster teams from across Alabama are going to the areas that were hardest hit and doing what they can to remove trees and debris and try to help families begin putting life back together. But I'd like for us to stop, if we could, for a moment and pray for those families who were affected this week and also pray for that army of volunteers who are going to be going across the state uh, and, and are already there uh, doing what they can to offer a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. I don't know if you, you may know, you may not know, but in every disaster team that goes out now from Alabama, there is a chaplain's team that goes along with them. And while a chainsaw crew may be removing trees and other debris, the chaplains are talking to the families that were impacted and taking advantage of the opportunity to share the gospel with them. It never fails that when an event like this happens and our chaplains go in, that we don't have stories coming out the other side of people who use this opportunity as a way to establish relationship with God and trust Him as their personal Savior for the very first time. These are great ministry opportunities that our volunteers are engaged in, and they're committed to that. So let's, let's pray for them this morning. Father, we pray today for those who were impacted by this week's storms. If we've never been through that, we don't know what they're experiencing, but Lord, we've seen the results of other storms, and we know the devastation that comes as a result of something like this happening. For those who had loved ones that did not survive the storms this week, we pray for those families. We pray for them as they grieve. We pray for them that you would provide peace for them. You would provide strength. You would be that friend that stays closer than a brother. You would do everything you can and use us in doing everything we can to make a difference. We pray for our volunteers who will be going into these areas and doing what they can to offer relief and help and hope. And Father, we thank you that in this storm, as in all of life's storms, you never leave us nor forsake us, and we can always count on you for resources beyond our means. Lord, we pray that we will, we will pray, that we will lift these folks to you on a daily basis and continue praying for them as they move forward in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. I regret I was not here last Sunday. I'm appreciative of Dr. Rick Lance for filling in in my absence, and I know you enjoyed him. I'm glad to be back with you today. Uh, there was a, an event on our calendar that got put there last September that when I started dealing with the search committee for the interim work, I told them there's one date that I've got that's out there that I can't move, uh, and it was last week, so that's over. Uh, I don't anticipate being gone any more in the immediate future unless something comes along that I'm not anticipating. Uh, but I do want to know, want you to know I'm glad to be back with you today and I'm looking forward to the Sundays that we will have uh, moving forward. Uh, I, I, would, I would remind you of what we talked about January 1st. Uh, we talked about you have to remember what God has done and we use that as an opportunity from the opening chapters of the book of Deuteronomy to talk a little bit about what God had done in Israel's past how God had from the very beginning began raising up uh, Moses to be the leader who would say to Pharaoh, let my people go, and how God led them out of Egyptian bondage, how, how God led them across the Red Sea, and how God began preparing for them and providing for them during the early days of their freedom. And you remember how God provided water when they needed it, and God provided food when they needed it, and God provided protection when they needed it. And he's reminding them in Deuteronomy as Moses comes to the end of his life for the people to pause a moment and remember what God has done because the word is if God has done it before, there's no reason why God can't do it again. 
If God has provided and protected for you in the past, he can certainly do it in the present. But I would also call you to remember that in Deuteronomy, Moses turns to a different subject starting in chapter 4 and moving forward uh, where he begins talking about remember what God commands. Because you see, there were expectations that God had for his people. Expectations that said, if I'm going to provide for you, if I'm going to protect you, if I'm going to give you water and food, if I'm going to do all these things, there are some things I expect in return. That's, that's realistic, isn't it? You would, you would think that God would have the right to say to his people, if you're going to experience my blessing, then here are some things you need to do in response. So I want you to start with me in, in, in really looking at, 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 this, at this passage uh, starting in chapter 5 and verse 1, I want us to, to read these verses in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 1, where the Word of God says, And Moses summoned all the people, all of Israel, and said, Hear, Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our ancestors that the Lord made this covenant, but with us. And with all of us who are alive here today, the Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire on the mountain. And at that time, I stood between the Lord and you to declare to you the word of the Lord, because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up to the mountain. And what he proceeds to do is to talk about these commandments, because there are relational requirements that God sets forth through these verses of Scripture relational requirements one of the things that we have the blessing of in life is having a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ to be able to have a life-changing relationship with Christ to go from what we were to what we are now is a blessing in itself to be able to look at what God has done in bringing us to this moment is a testimony of the faithfulness of God but you also understand that in addition to the faithfulness of God, God has expected some things from us in return. Now, these Ten Commandments that were originally given in the book of Exodus are repeated for us in Deuteronomy chapter 5, and I would remind you of what these relational requirements involve. First of all, there's allegiance to God. The first four commandments that God gave the children of Israel were commandments that specifically related to the relationship between the children of Israel and God. And God said, if, if I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people, here are some requirements in terms of your allegiance to me. He talks about you're, you're not to have any other gods. There, there, there are no other gods as far as God is concerned. He is the one true God, the holy God, the one who is above all and in all and through all, and there is no other God allowance made for in Scripture. Matter of fact, Jesus even came to the point of looking at the relationship between our, our thoughts of God and money, or mammon, as King James would call it. And, and Jesus would go so far as to say, you can't, you can't put those on equal terms in your life. You can't put God and money on equal terms. One is going to outrank the other. And nine times out of ten, the material will outrank the spiritual in terms of priority. So when he talks about no other gods, he means just that. We're not to have any other gods, regardless of what that God's name is. It may not even be a God that's a person. It may be a God that's something in your life that has taken priority over God. And this relational requirement in Deuteronomy 5 is that we have no other gods before him no idols nothing else we bow and worship to god takes priority god takes precedence over all of that no worship or service to other gods it's it's god's way of reminding the people if you're going to be my people if i'm going to bless you and if i'm going to provide for you then i expect that our relationship be one where you put me at the forefront of your life and nothing takes priority over me no dishonoring of god or his day as people would point out well god took the seventh day to rest so i take sunday off and i rest I don't 
think God just laid down and took a nap all day on the Sabbath, did he? He was still active even though he was not working that day. He had already created everything, and that Sabbath day was an example to the people that there ought to be at least one day a week where you say this is God's day and nothing is going to take priority over him on that day. God's going to be at the forefront of my life, and I'm going to let him impact every relationship with I ha that I have. And, and the most important relationship I have is with God himself. It's more important than the relationship I have with family. It's more important than relationship I have with church. It's more important than relationship I have at work or at school or anywhere else I go in life. The, the one relationship that takes priority over every other, as far as God is concerned, is our relationship with Him. So there's allegiance to God, but there's also relation to others. The next six commandments talk about our our activity in relating to one another he talks about parental care honor your father and mother this is the only commandment that god gave that carried a promise with it and that promise was that your days may be long upon the earth so the the, the value of family and the value of parents and the care for those individuals is a priority as far as god is concerned the value of life god said thou shalt not kill it's the, it's the importance of resisting this, this movement of taking life of someone else, whether it's a baby in the womb or whether it's a mature adult. Jesus and God himself takes that responsibility very seriously when it comes to the value of life. He talked about the sanctity of marriage and, and how you're not to commit adultery. It's, it's his way of talking about the importance of, of man and woman in the bond of marriage. And being faithful to one another and letting that be a lifelong commitment that we make to each other. Respectful property of what belongs to others. He said, thou shalt not steal. So don't take what belongs to somebody else. It's another of those relational requirements that God laid out for his people. He talked about the value of truth. Don't bear false witness. Tell the truth. I've always contended in church life one basic little mantra that I've used, and that is tell the truth and trust the people. I don't think leadership in a church needs to withhold information from the congregation that the congregation needs in making decisions about its future direction and course. There's, a, there's, a, there's some truth to that. There's some, there's some power in that. When you start talking about the fact that this, this congregation called Dalrada Baptist Church has an interest in what this ministry is doing. And, and, and as leaders, we, we, we owe you at least the, the expression of what we understand to be the current situation. So if you ask us a question, you're not going to get a dance-around answer. We're going to tell you the truth. I mean, I don't know any other way to operate in the life of the church. I think this principle is certainly relevant. Then there's wanting what belongs to others. God said, thou shalt not covet. You don't go through life trying to figure out how you can get what somebody else has. Relational requirements. If you can imagine with me what those relational requirements are, if you think of the first four, they're, they're vertical. They're between you and God. And the last six are horizontal. They're between you and man. You can picture the cross in that context, can't you? relationship with God, relationship with each other. God said, if you're going to be my people and experience my blessing and all that I'm going to bring for you, then you need to understand there are requirements in relationship with me and in relationship with your fellow human beings. Relational requirements. But there are also foundational requirements. There's another passage in Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you would turn there with me. And look with me, starting in verse 4. Many believe that John 3.16 is the anchor verse of the New Testament. It's the verse, you could argue, upon which all the other verses of the New Testament are built. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Many of us have memorize that as a child and we've quoted it throughout our life but it's it's considered to be the anchor verse of the new testament if that's true then this verse very well could become the anchor verse of the old testament 
It's the passage upon which the Old Testament is built. It's the passage upon which relationship with God is built. It's the passage upon which relationship with others would be built. And here's what, here's what the Word of God says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, now notice some things in that verse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our, that's a personal pronoun, the Lord, He is one. That means there is nobody besides Him. Okay, we've already confirmed that through the looking at the Ten Commandments, those first four. But when you talk about the Lord our God, you're talking about a personal relationship, aren't you? You're, you're implying that there's something there between you and God that, that some people may not experience, may not enjoy, may not be able to feel. He is our God. We are His children. Therefore, here is what God says is to be the priority of life for us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's pretty significant, don't you think? That's, a, that's an affirmation of priorities, what that is. That's, that's God saying you're not to have anything in your life that is more important than me. So as you consider God's commandments this morning, this is the great one. And if you want to look into the New Testament and get confirmation of this, go to the passage where Jesus was confronted by one of his uh, folks who wanted to try to trick him up and said, Look, Master, what, what is the greatest commandment? Pick one of the ten. And the answer of Jesus came without hesitation. And his answer was not one of the ten at all. His answer was Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And he said also there's a second commandment that I would add to it that's likened to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's why I say the whole Old Testament really centers around this verse. This, this passage of Scripture becomes the anchor passage of the Old Testament. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And Jesus would add, and love your neighbor as yourself. That becomes the priority of anyone who would claim relationship with God that is life-changing. If you have a personal relationship with Jesus, if you can go back to the day where you saw yourself as a sinner and you turned from that sin and trusted Jesus as your Savior, followed Him through believer's baptism and have been trying to follow Him ever since with your life, then you understand the life-changing power that Jesus has over your life. And God is saying when that happens, when you're in relationship with Him, the, the number one priority of your life over everything else is to love Him with all your heart, soul, and strength. That passage is called the Shema. The Shema, even to this day, if you go to Israel and you, you're around Orthodox Jews at their time of prayer, they will have a little box attached to their forehead that's tied on, and inside that little box will be this verse of Scripture. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and and strength. So since we're looking back during the month of January, since we're remembering, maybe it would be a good time for a checkup right now in your life. Where do you stand in relationship with God? Can you honestly say this morning that in your relationship with God, He is primary over any other relationship you have? that you're always consulting Him and considering Him when decisions are made about the direction of your life? that you'd always be willing to pause and say, God, what would you have me to do? Like Jesus did when he was, when he was on the night of his arrest, when he said, Father, if it be thy will, let, not this, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He was seeking out the will of the Father. Is that something that you and I do on a consistent daily basis? This verse says, if we're going to 
be in relationship with God and we're going to seek to live life under his control, then we'll love him with all our heart, soul, and strength. But he didn't stop there. He went on to talk about the primary responsibility of parents. Notice what he says in verse 7. Impress them on your children. Talk with them. Uh, when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gate. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And teach these precepts, these concepts to your children. <laughs> now, I would contend that as a parent, the most important responsibility we have is for the spiritual instruction of our children. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Now, I have two children and five grandchildren. I couldn't tell you how many hours I've spent with Lyle and Jackson and Jacob throwing baseballs and footballs and shooting basketballs and stuff like that in the backyard. Because every boy raised in Alabama needs to be able to throw and catch and hit. Would you agree with that? I mean, everybody, if you're going to live in Alabama, my goodness alive, you can't get through life without those basic skills. But sometimes as parents, we can carry that a little bit too far. We can begin to think that it's more important to teach them how to throw a baseball than it is to have a personal relationship with Jesus. But what God is saying here to the children of Israel is, as parents, the most important thing you're going to do is make a spiritual investment into the lives of your children. Because what your children learn about God at home, it's going to be the foundation for what they build on their life for decades to come. And if there is no spiritual foundation, then the world is going to tell them how to believe and how to live. And they're not going to know any better. They're going to think, well, well, since everybody else is doing it, I'll do it too. But God said very clearly, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength. Don't let anything take priority over him and impress upon your children these principles. Live it in front of them. Talk with them about it. Pray in front of them. Pray with them. Read God's word to them. Talk to them about the life lessons that you're learning as you go through that journey together. Did you know there's a parent lab right after church this morning? Where if you've got children in preschool, children in, in youth, youth ages, student ages, uh, this, this seminar this afternoon is going to talk about how to worship with your family. There's nothing you're going to do in your life with relating to your kids that's more important than that. It is the most important thing you're going to do in helping get them from the point of birth to the point where they step out on their own and become responsible for themselves. Impress these on your children. It's part of those foundational requirements. But there are also some foundational principles that we need to talk about. Look in chapter 11, verses 13 through 21. And here's what the Word of God says. So if you faithfully obey the commands I'm giving you today to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will send rain to your land in its seasons, both autumn and spring rain, so that you may, have, may gather in your grain new wine and olive oil. I will provide grass in the fields for your cattle, and I will eat and be satisfied. Now, let's just be honest. Most of us would like the results without having to do what it takes to get the results. We would like it if God would just automatically bless us, regardless of how we live, regardless of what kind of decisions or choices we make in life, that God would just somehow, because He's obligated as good as we are, He's obligated somehow just to do these things for us because, well, after all, we're us. <laughs> Did you catch the if-then, the conditional clause of that passage? 
he, he did say, as we read there, if you faithfully obey the commands I'm giving you today to love the Lord your God with all your heart and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then will I send rain. The blessing, the blessing follows the obedience. That's a novel idea, isn't it? That if we're going to enjoy the blessings that God has for us, God requires that we be obedient to him in return, and that means we love him with all our heart, soul, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself. If we do those things, God says, you don't have to worry about your life. You don't have to be afraid of what's going to happen tomorrow because God says, I've got your back. I I'm with you. I'm never going to leave you. I'm not going to turn and walk away from you. You've got the promise of God walking alongside of you in the person of the Holy Spirit every single day of your life when you live life according to that principle. When your priority of life is to love God with your heart, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, when you practice that in your own faithful obedience, God says, I will keep my word. I will provide what you need in your life. I will provide those basic necessities. So Jesus could come to the Sermon on the Mount and say, don't be anxious about your life, about what you'll eat and what you'll wear and what you'll put on, where you'll live. He goes on down and says, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things even before you ask. Jesus' way of saying this in Matthew 6 would be, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So the main principle of this context is love God and serve God. Love him, serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Don't let anything in your life take priority over him. And then he said, I'll send rain, I'll grow grass, I'll judge if you turn away, I'll bless. And before we're through with Deuteronomy, we're going to come to the concepts of blessing and cursing. times when God judged the people because they made bad choices and bad choices always carry consequences and unfortunately bad choices generally always produce bad consequences so God's consistent in that like any parent would be except with us we draw that line and tell our child not to cross that line and we back up and see what they're going to do. And they cross it. And we've already said, if you cross that line, here's what I'm going to do. And then all we do is back up a little bit more and draw another line. Well, if you cross that line, <laughs> I, I'm going to get you. Not going to be happy. And we back up a little bit and they cross that line and we just keep crossing lines to the point where those lines don't mean anything. Listen, when God draws a line in your life, God never intends to move it. When God says, this is the requirement, when God says, this is the commandment, love me with all your heart, soul, and strength, he's not going to back up and say, oh, but for those of you at Dalrada this morning, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to extend the line a little bit and give you some grace. <laughs> he's going to treat all of us the same way. And every time we disobey God, there are consequences that we have to deal with. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is when you obey God, the blessings, they're automatic. He'll provide them. So where are you this morning? Where are you in relationship with God this morning? In your own personal life. I'm not asking to look around and try to determine where somebody else is but where are you this morning in your relationship with God can you say as you sit here this morning as you've gone through this past week you've tried to live by that principle of loving God with all your heart soul and strength and you've tried not to let anything take priority over him in your life so when the phone rings and the doctor's office is on the other end with not so good news from a recent test you immediately panic 
and go into panic mode without ever considering the fact that God has that too. There is nothing you're going to go through in life that God can't handle. So trust Him. Love Him with all your heart, soul, and strength. And sit back and watch what God does in response. Pray with me. Father, thank you this morning for the moments that we've had to look at this passage of Scripture and to be reminded that you require of us that we love you with all our heart, soul, and strength, and when we do, you are promising to keep our needs met in the background. You know what we need even before we ask, and you have resources to meet those needs, so help us to be faithful. Help us to love you, not let anything ahead of you. Always consider doing what we can to bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You might be here this morning in this service and you've never had one of those life-changing relationships with Jesus that I talked about earlier. You've never had a point in your life where you've been convicted of your sin by the Holy Spirit and you've repented or turned from that sin and trusted Jesus as your Savior. Would it surprise you to know that if you come this morning and let me talk to you, we can, we can cover that in about five minutes? won't take all day the, the gospel is very simple about what we need to do if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness so if you're in that boat today where you've never trusted jesus as your savior i invite you to come be glad to pray with you and talk with you maybe you want to come join this church maybe dal is where you think you need to be and you see a, an opportunity for you to be involved in service with this congregation I invite you to come. Maybe, maybe you want to come to the altar and pray about a need in your life, about something in your life that came up this week when you didn't love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And you want to make sure you walk out of here today with that commitment settled and resolved. Whatever decision God would lay on your heart, would you come as we stand together? I'll be here to receive you and look forward to you coming.